Good morning, welcome, nice to see you. Good to have the two sisters here today. My mates, this message is perhaps somewhat for you today. And uh, I uh, want to remind you how we said we're starting 2024 off. Remember we said we want to get to know God better. We want to get to know God better. And it's quite easy to say, yeah, I'm in. I want to get to know God better when things are going well. When I've just got married or when I've got this and that and this and that. That's easy to get to know God better. But what happens when... Things don't go well. When you line up at the manga, they say you must pronounce it correctly and you, you, your body is depleted from the gun and you are so sick and you cannot do, you want to complete, but you, you're battling health-wise. What happens when things don't go well? What happens when you start suffering for no reason and you're like, why God? What, what, is, what is going, then it's not so easy to say, I want to get to know God better. When, when atheists face tough times, when things aren't going well, it's easy for them to say, oh, you know what, that's part of life. Eh? You know, bad things happen. When, when things go wrong for us as Christians, it's not so easy because we believe that God is good and God is fair and God is just and I am a Christian and things mustn't go wrong with me. It's not so easy to get to know God better. And I don't know about you, but I go straight to my default setting when I learned that at Ranfield pre-primary. It's not fair. He didn't invite me to his party. It's not fair. I go to that default setting. If it's God, it's not fair. I'm innocent. I'm trying to serve you, God, with my life. I'm trying to do things. God, that's not fair. Why is this happening to me? And so when things don't go well, when things do go well, we've always got to go to the Bible and understand what the Bible says about life, good times, bad times, seasons that we go through. And the best place to look at from God's Word is the book of Job, when things don't go well. And so I want to ask you to turn with me in your Bible to straight in the middle. You'll see Psalms. One book before Psalms is Job. Very easy to find that book. Get your smartphone out there, young man, and find it there with your wife. It's an interesting story. Job is the perfect example of somebody who is living life in a, in a good, godly way. He's got everything. He's lost 10 children. Just like that. He's lost thousands of sheep. I said 5,000. My wife said, how do you know? So I'll just say thousands. He lost thousands of sheep, plenty donkeys, plenty camels, lost his kids, lost his properties and his houses. And this is the situation that he finds himself in. So when you think things are not fair and you're going through tough times, I trust this message today is going to help you as it's helped me and he's still busy helping me. I want to ask you this morning, if, if you've lost a child, maybe you've had a miscarriage, maybe you've lost a spouse prematurely, it's like we had way more years together as a husband and a wife, you were trusting for 55 years in your marriage, and you lost your spouse way too early, maybe you've lost a business, maybe you are busy losing a business, you lost something, I'm going to ask you in a moment to stand, I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want you to trust that today's message is specifically for you. And don't switch off and think, oh, well, Daryl, now we're talking about negative again. No, no. Things can change like that. You don't know what's ahead of you this week, friends. Maybe something's happened to you this week which has caused loss in your life. Caused you to lie awake at night and, and not be able to sleep. I want to tell you about a man this morning who I've had the privilege of meeting. Because his two nieces, your daughter and your son, who I ride bicycles with, went to my brother's office and said, please, can you get Foxy's number? Because their cousin, your son, 17 years old, your butt, passed on with leukemia. And when I thought of this message today, Jason, I, I, I thought of you. I thought of you, ma'am, visiting for the first time this morning in church. I, I, I think you're a widow and how you sit next to another widow and she holds your hand during worship for the first time. You, you're praising Jesus with the Savior. I don't know your story. I don't know everybody's story. But I would love you to stand with me if you are going through a specific time of, of suffering and, and loss in your life right now. Would you stand? Maybe it's a, a sudden illness. That you've just experienced, the doctors have diagnosed you perhaps with this illness that they say is terminal. I want to ask you today if you've maybe lost your innocence. 
would you stand? I want to ask you today, if you're suffering because of mental illness, you do not know why, would you stand? Emotional illness. It's tough when you go through times of suffering. And so today I pray that for you specifically, as you stand here today, that God would speak to you through this story. And that he'd speak to each one of us. Can we pray? We study this book of Job today, God. It's a complicated book. Some of it doesn't quite make sense. But I pray today that as these people stand with me, that we will find a grace that only you can give us when things do not make sense. Why am I sick at the biggest race of my life? Why am I busy losing a business? Why have I lost a spouse? Why did that happen and cause me to lose my innocence? All these unanswered questions, God. I pray that we wouldn't just overlook suffering as people sitting here and think, ah, just get over it. I pray today that we would find a grace from your Holy Spirit, but a grace from the Bible, the story, but also grace from people around us who would hold our hand and worship you as a friend, even though they may not know what's happening. Help us today, in Jesus' name, to have an internal perspective on, on life. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Job chapter 1. This is how it goes. In the land of Uz, there lived a man. Uz is like a normal place like Boxburg or Benoni. There lived a man whose name was was Job. This man was blameless. This man was upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Say blameless. Blameless. And upright. He feared God. He shunned evil. There's only one other man like Job in the Bible. His name is Jesus. He feared God, he was blameless, and he shunned evil. And so Job doesn't have the privilege of knowing about Jesus. He only knew about God. We have the privilege of knowing about Jesus. We know that he was a man who was blameless and upright and shunned evil. And Jesus took the blame upon himself. Job blamed God. And there's this parallel between Job and and Jesus in this story. It's amazing. And then God at one stage or another puts each one of us in a similar situation as to what Job went through, friends. And some of you are going through that right now. That's why you've stood this morning. I want to say today, today, you have the incredible example to rely on Jesus, your king, as you stood just now. Verse 4, Job's seven sons, my goodness, They used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters. So there's ten siblings and all their mates to the jaw at one of their houses. Proper. And just in case they sinned, Job would wake up early, very early in the morning. Where's that? You, sir, told me this week that you wake up at half past three in the morning to spend time with God in your lounge. This is what Job used to do. He used to wake up early in the morning, and he used to maybe hear about the party that had gone down. He maybe was at the party and left early because he's old and would have maybe woken up and checked all the bottles, checked maybe some substances, checked who was still sleeping in some of the rooms and he would have thought, flip God, maybe my kids have sinned last night. Maybe my kids have grieved your Holy Spirit. And he would pray and say, God, please, please God, if they have messed up, if they have lost their innocence, if they have done something that has hurt you and and that's sinned, I don't know if I can pray this, but God, please, can you just forgive them? Incredible man, eh? You know what it says in Job 31? It says, Job made a covenant with his eyes that he would not look lustfully at a woman. It's a proper oak, this oak. Blameless, upright, feared God, shunned evil, prayed for his kids, didn't look lustfully at a woman. If, if an example of Jesus is too far away for you, oh, Jesus is perfect, then go and look at Job. Just try and live a life like Job. And I'm talking to myself. Amazing man. Verse 6, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan also comes along with them. Satan means the opposition. He, it, Satan means the accuser or the enemy. This book about Job is not actually about him. 
Quibus. This is a book telling us about this wrestle, a conversation between God and the devil. That's what this book is actually all about. And it's a conversation that is actually one-sided because it is God that addresses Satan. It, was, it is the superior God who is addressing Satan, the inferior. God always speaks to Satan and Satan replies. Satan never addresses God. Whew, it's quite amazing to read. Satan never has the right to, to say something to God. He only replies to God. But when the conversation goes down between Job and God, it's a two-way conversation. It is Job asking God questions. Why, God? And it is God replying to Job, giving him answers to his questions. Not straight away. Sometimes only 38 chapters later does God reply to Job. But he does respond to Job. I want to tell you today, friends, God will have a dialogue with people who are suffering and going through challenging times, even if they don't understand it. You have to know that it's in the book of Job. But we have to realize that there is this wrestle going on in the spiritual realm over your life and over your life, Jenny, between God and the enemy about how we conduct our lives. Well, give me an example, Daryl, about how this wrestle in the spiritual realm goes over your life. Last week, Saturday, I'm riding my bicycle with my mates. We had a jewel and we're going down Sylvia's Pass back home now. And a young man from Chinatown pulls in front of us. They say we were going 72 kilometers an hour. And he takes one of my mates out on his bicycle. And before I can think... I'm through his window, and I'm trying to take out his keys from the ignition and get him out of the car because he will not climb out of the car. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? There's this wrestle in the spiritual over how I react between God and the enemy, what I choose to do and what I do not choose to do. How's your relationships been the week, this week? Between boss, colleague, husband, wife. Mine hasn't been great. My wife came home Monday night, 10 o'clock. I was tired, half asleep, and I banged the door closed. Not on purpose, though, but it did bang. <laughs> I didn't mean to bang it. How many conversations have gone down this week where you've banged the phone down? How many conversations this week have ended where, where there's been hurts and pain and you got out your car, you sped off. How many conversations, relationships, issues this week have gone totally pear-shaped? There's a wrestle going on in the spiritual, how we choose and how we are going to choose to react. It's in the book of Job. And so sometimes we end relationships because we don't know if there's a war going on over our lives. Verse 8, the Lord says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody on earth like Job. He is blameless. He's upright. He fears me. He shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replies. Have you not put, Satan says, have you not put a hedge of protection over Job and his entire household and everything that he has. This is maybe one of the most powerful one-liners in the Bible. God puts a hedge of protection around those who love him. And Satan cannot do anything because there's that hedge of protection around them. But sometimes God will allow a little gap in the hedge. And you might be sitting there saying, Daryl, don't be so super spiritual. You cannot blame God for everything that goes bad in somebody's life. Yes, you are 100% right. You cannot do that. W what do you mean? Well, your ex-husband hasn't paid the bond for three months. And so the bank come and want to repossess the house. That is not God's fault. That is your ex-husband's fault. He hasn't paid the car and they come and repossess the car. You, you can't blame God. For everything. Sometimes we suffer because of other people's choices and other people's decisions that they've made over your life. And sometimes suffering does come because God will allow a little gap 
in the hedge. And you might say, Daryl, that is not biblical. It's in the book of Job. You cannot argue about something that's in the Bible here, friends. And so we don't know that there's this war going on over our lives between good and evil. We've got to understand that today, friends. And maybe you're saying, okay, but Daryl, then I don't feel very safe as a Christian. No, friends, we sit here on this earth under the blood of Jesus, under the victory that we have as sons and daughters of our heavenly father. He protects us. He watches over us. Psalm 121, is it on there, Mel? It says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? I'm in trouble, God. This is David. My enemy is going to kill me. My help comes from the Lord. He will watch my coming and my going both now and forevermore. He watches over me. He watches over you. Maybe he doesn't slumber. God doesn't sleep. And there's a hedge of protection. But he may sometimes allow a little gap in that hedge. And we're going to read about that now. But I want to ask you this, friends. When something happens to you, and you do suffer, and you do go through tough, tough times, I want to ask you, instead of lowering your understanding of God, ask God to raise your faith. Monday night, some of the ladies in the church are at my Boots and Kirsty's house. They're packing Easter egg packs for the kids for Easter service. And I've asked Swayze if I can share the story. It's amazing. They leave at about quarter to nine. Swayze drives past Pick and Pay Lakefield Square. And there's a lady, very well dressed with a handbag, waving the traffic down. She's frantic. And so Swayze stops. Ask this lady what's going on. She says, I've had a massive fight with my boyfriend. I need a lift to the BP garage or here on Great North Road. And so Swayze says, jump in. Where's Rob and Michelle Balfour? Are they here? Michelle Balfour and my Michelle are driving home from the meeting as well. And Rob's Michelle says to my Michelle, what's happening there? Something doesn't look lacquer. And so they decide to phone Swayze who says, I'm giving this lady a lift. She needs a lift. And so Michelle and Michelle say, we're following you. And they follow her to the BP. And as Swayze stops at the BP, this lady climbs out. And Swayze is looking for her cell phone, which is normally near the gear lever in the center console of the vehicle. Can't find it. Pushes her nice smartwatch to see, where's my phone? It rings in the lady's handbag. You and your lady's handbags. And so Swayze says, give me my phone. It's in your bag. No, I'm not giving you your phone. And as this is going down, the Michelle and Michelle pull up right next to Swayze. And so she thinks, oh, well, I better give Swayze's phone back. And so she gives the phone back. But catch this story. Twenties at home with the kids, reading them stories, putting them to bed. And little Ruzenka, who's lying on her mom's lap this morning, says to her dad at about quarter to nine, Dad, we must pray for mom. We must ask God to protect mom. And so they pray this prayer that is not usual for a little girl to pray for her mom out the blue for God to protect her mom. Friends, I ask you again, when you go through tough times and there's harm and stuff, you need to understand there's a wrestle in the spiritual realm between good and evil. And God will use a little eight-year-old girl to put her mother on her heart to pray for her for protection. There's a hedge. But sometimes... There's a little gap in the hedge. And I ask you today, don't allow that gap to lower your understanding of God. But instead, ask God to raise your level of faith. Like a little girl's used by an eight-year-old. Come on, may that story encourage us. Someone said this morning, they've had an argument because someone says the Holy Spirit doesn't move in people's lives today. The Holy Spirit works in people's hearts when he uses an eight-year-old girl to pray for her mother. God's alive. His spirit is moving all over the world. Like the waters cover the sea. Like a mighty revelation. As the spirit moves, friends. Allow your faith to grow. He's at work, man. Here comes a big question. Brace yourself for this. I want to ask you today. Do we serve God for benefit? Or do we serve God because he's God? Ask you again, do you serve God for benefit as a Christian? A bit of prosperity gospel. Or do you serve God because he's God? Because this is what's happened in, in Job's life. Verse 10, Satan tunes God. He says, the only reason that Job is serving you, God, because you've blessed the work of his hands. 
so that his flocks and his herds are spread all over the land. But God, stretch out your hand, strike everything that Job has, and he will surely curse you to your face. This is what's going down. Satan's saying, it's very easy for Job to worship you. It's very easy to live a blameless, upright life because things are lacquer. But just let's test him. Open a little hedge there. And I ask you again today, friends, do you serve God for benefit like Job maybe was doing? Or do you serve God because he is God? I ask you, if God allowed something, lots, everything to be taken away from you, would you still serve him? And so you can go and read about it. The Sabians come, they, they kill all his donkeys and they kill his servants. And, and then a fire comes and it takes out all the sheeps, thousands of them, maybe 5,000 of the sheeps, they get burnt. And his servants, they get taken out. And then the, the Sheldeans come, the other part of the enemy come, they, they steal and kill his camels. And they kill his servants. And, and then what happens is a mighty wind comes. How's this? Oaks are having a jewel at the party, the 10 siblings with all their mates. Wind comes, takes out the house, collapses on them, all of them die. Just like that, one shot. Loses all of his 10 kids. And then, in verse 20, at the news of all of this, this is Job now, he hears about what's happened. So many bad things. He got up, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, he falls to the ground in worship, and he says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away May the name of the Lord be praised. That is the song that you have just sung this morning. And Dean said I should try and sing it. He gives and takes away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You sang it beautifully. Job's making a decision. God, you've given me so much. But you've taken away. But my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Can you sing that song today from your heart? And you can also sing really well. Can you sing from your heart those words? Some churches can't. Some churches tweak it. They change it. And instead of singing, you give and you take away, they say, you give and make away. That's not theology, friends. God gives and God takes Away, can you sing that song? And you're saying, Daryl, it's a couple of words. Of course I can. But I saw you. I was at the back, sir. And I saw you singing that song, You Give and Take Away. And I saw you singing it with your hands raised. And I don't know you, but I'm not sure if there's stuff in your life. And then I looked, there's a lady behind you. I was at school with her. And she's not married anymore. And she's battling financially. And she was singing with her hands raised. You give and you take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Can you sing that song? When you watch a family and you spend time getting to know a family whose brother is not with them, whose nephew is not with them. Can you sing those songs and those words? This is how the theology goes in the book of Job. God is just. And Job believes, Frip, I'm innocent. I've done nothing wrong. So he feels like God is being unjust. He feels like God is treating him very badly and that it's not fair in how he's being treated. And after losing absolutely everything, what happens? You can read it. He gets these painful sores, boil-like sores, from the top of his head all the way to the bottom of his toes. He's covered in these sores. And then in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, yeah, he opens his mouth and he curses the day of his birth. He's basically saying, I should never have been born. Something switched in his way of thinking now. Just a while ago, he was saying, God, I will choose to say, no matter what happens, blessed be your name. Now he's saying, stuff this. I shouldn't have been born. Why is this happening to me? I should not be experiencing what I'm going through. And then in chapter 10, he says, I loathe my very life. Therefore, now, China, I'm going to give free reign. To my complaint, I'm going to speak out. Why am I sick? 
I've trained all year for this race. Why am I sick now? Why has my husband left me now? Why is this happening? Why have I lost all of this? Now I'm going to get free, free reign. I do not care. Something's exploded in his head. Something's popped. I'm done here, God. You know what he's doing? He's putting God in the dock. And he's saying, God, you come and sit down here. I'm going to look into your eyes and you are going to explain to me why I'm going through this. Why after 10 years of marriage, I've been treated like this. Why this has happened in my life. Why he's left me. And God says to Job, really? Really, is that how it's going to go? You're going to put me in the dock and you're going to ask me a couple of questions. Something's happened here in Job. Why? What got into his head? We're going to talk about it. Maybe it was his friends that were influencing him and telling him what to do. But something's happened. And now he's asking God questions as to what's happening. And, and so then after he's put God in the dock and asked some questions in, 30, in chapter 38, verse 1, this is what happens. The Lord answered Job out of the storm. Job's lost everything, eh? Camels's, sheeps's, donkeys's, everything's gone. He's lost absolutely everything. He's covered in sores. And God is saying, now, Job, I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm going to put you in the dock. I'm going to sit you down. Come and sit here, Job. I want to ask you some questions. Verse 1 of 38 says, God says, who is this oak? This guy called Job that obscures my plans with words Without knowledge. I like this one liner. Brace yourself like a man, Job. And I've been wondering, my wife and I, what type of tone did God use here? Was it stern? Brace yourself like a man, aggressive, like sit down, trying to shut up. I don't think so. My wife and I, brace yourself like a man. You've asked me questions. Now it's time. Sit down. Not sarcastic. Gentle, perhaps. Brace yourself. Like a man, I'm going to ask you some questions. Job's keeping quiet four chapters. He doesn't say anything in reply. This is how it goes. It's amazing. Where were you, Job, when I laid the earth's foundations? Job, you think you're such a clever oak. Where were you when I gave orders to the morning? When I told the sun to rise at such and such a time, it is not by chance that the sun rises at such and such a time and you get up. And you ride your bicycle. Where were you when I was in the deepest parts of the sea, Job? Job, you think you're so clever. Have you seen the storehouses of snow that I've stored up in heaven, Job? You must have because you think you're so clever. Job, have you ever seen the storehouses of hail that I've stored in heaven? And Job, when it rains, surely you've seen how I make a, a channel for the torrents of rain to pour down through the sky. Surely, Job, if you think you know everything, Job, then surely you must have seen that. And this is a one-liner that I absolutely love. He says this to Job. He says, does the eagle soar at your command, Job? My wife loves the mountains. And when we see those birds of prey in the mountains, he's saying to Job, that eagle that soars through the Drakensberg Mountains soars at my command. No wonder Job is quiet. He's like, freak. He's putting me in my place. But I think God was doing it in a gentle, firm, stern way. And he has a one-liner that's going to make you laugh. He says, Job, when that crocodile at Crocworld at Scottborough sneezes and it blows out some water, I see it sneeze. Do you, Job? quite funny this crocodile with the scales on its back god says i see i notice every time that crocodile sneezes and job if you're so clever mate and you've got it all together do you also see friends we've just sung about that eh? indescribable uncontainable you put the stars in the sky you call them by name he says that to job he says but there's billions of stars out there galaxies that we actually are only discovering now I've called all of those stars by name, Job. No wonder he's silent. He cannot answer God. He's saying, I created the stars, indescribable. Maybe Job should have put the DVD player in and watched the DVD of Louis Giglio's indescribable. He would have been able to think, flip. Okay, God, I'm small. You are massive. Job, 
He's beginning to realize that he doesn't have the answers. And so God is saying, please, Job, please, Daryl, please, Clinton, stop questioning what is going on. Stop questioning why this is happening to you, Daryl, and understand how small you are and how big I am. And I have a long-term plan. It doesn't make sense to you now, but I'm God And I'm in charge and I am in control. That's what he's busy telling Job here. How does God answer our questions of suffering? Think about it. He keeps reminding us how small we are and how big he is. And if your life seems right now that it's on its head and will I ever find a man who will love me again? Will I ever find financial gain again in my life? Will I ever be okay again financially? I want to say to you today, man, as you sing that song, my heart will choose to say, allow this story to remind you, man, I'm small. And God is massive, the creator of the universe. Put James 5 on, Mel, you got it, man, verse 11. This is written 2,000 years later after the story about Job. eh? This is James. He says, guys, you've heard about Job's perseverance. And you've seen what the Lord has finally brought about in his life after all of the suffering. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Written 2,000 years later, hey friends. If God had said to Job, you're going to go through this very tough time. You're going to lose absolutely everything. But there's a bigger plan here, mate. Because in 2024, there's a group of 300 and maybe 30 people sitting in a school hall that's a bit hot and a bit stuffy. And some of them are awake and realizing, flip, I'm taking a piece of the puzzle out of James's life, uh, out of Job's life, and I want to apply it in my life. Surely Job would say, flip, there's a bigger picture here. God is going to use my story to challenge others who are too going through times of suffering and unanswered questions. He would maybe say, okay, I'm in. There's a way bigger picture. Friends, there's a bigger picture. And I don't say that casually, my mate. I don't say that casually, Christina, and to the same family. Your suffering right now is incredible. And maybe someone else's suffering that I do not know about is just as hard and painful. But I'm trusting that through this story today, we will realize that there's a plan that doesn't make sense. Why? If I was God, I wouldn't have taken your 17-year-old. I wouldn't have allowed your 17-year-old boy. I mean, he's electrocuted at the age of 12 in Mozambique. There's a bigger plan for his life. God is using him in a somewhat imperfect way to turn pinnacle upside down by showing black men how they are accepted and part of the culture there. Why, God? Surely there was a plan. Surely. We don't know. There's There's a plan. There are unanswered questions. He will use situations that we do not understand, that don't make sense. Friends, I ask you today, what are we getting out of this story? How does God answer our suffering? Number one, he tells us how great he is. Indescribable, uncontainable. The, the, the storehouses of snow, the eagle, the crocodile, I'm in control. I laid the foundations of the earth. I am massive, God says. You are small. That's what he's saying. And if God is big enough to be cross with him, then he's big enough for us to live with unanswered questions. That's the theology of Job, friends. Number two, he never tells us why he's doing it. He doesn't tell us why he's allowing that to happen. He doesn't tell us why he allowed a little gap in the hedge to take place. And number three, even in the storm, God is gracious. Because Jesus, who is a picture of Job, Dean reminded me, Job is a picture of Jesus. He took the full brunt of the storm. He was wounded for our transgressions. Jesus was crushed. He took the brunt of it. Job thought he was going to get crushed in that storm, friends. He should have. He deserved to. But Jesus took it to when he was spot on this morning during worship. Friends, suffering that some of us are going through right now, yes, there's a plan. And God is using it as hard as what it is. Trust him. To raise your level of faith and understanding when that suffering comes. In Jesus' name. Amen.